Well, let's just check emails. Oh, there you are. This is Wretched Radio. I'm like Toyota. I asked for it, and I got it uh, two days ago, give or take. What day is today? Who am I? Why am I here? We discussed mandated Vs. Why? Because we can't say the V word. And nevertheless, we wanted to have a biblical discussion on how to noodle through an issue that a lot of Christians are disagreeing on these days. And that's okay. We can do that agreeably. And that is exactly what you did. I don't know how many emails I received. I suspect it was triple digits. Not one was snarky or mean or like, well, pretty much all of social media. (laughs) Instead, everyone was gracious. And hey, what about this? And even when it was just a flat out disagreement, you were still polite and, and, and godly. So thank you for that. And might I In response to your emails, begin with this. I was not actually trying to present a side. Should you or shouldn't you take this if it is mandated either by government or your employer? I I was not trying to do that. I do have an opinion on it. But I would also add this little caveat, which might be helpful for all of us when we hear about a situation going on in somebody's life and we render a quick verdict. Because here's the reality for me right now. The issue of a mandated V, I am thinking it through because it sure looks like that's the direction that we're headed in. But I'm still not in that, that pickle yet. You think through things differently when you're actually in it. And that is why it is good for us to remember when we hear somebody making a familial decision, it's a business decision, before we just quickly render a verdict, trying to put ourselves into those shoes, which we can never fully do, is a helpful exercise. And so I will admit to you, because I do do have a loved one who is being confronted by this. And it is it has caused me to think about, okay, what would I do? And that's precisely what we want to do right now as best we can. And this will hopefully be helpful for you if you are currently in this pickle. Let me make my way through your emails so that we can noodle through together how best to respond to this situation biblically. And it opens up a very specific issue that has been, we have to admit, contested throughout Protestant history. We see, going back into the 15th century, give or take 1450-something, there, there was a document presented from the church in Magdeburg, Germany. You see, Charles, he wasn't being very friendly toward Protestants. He was bearing down trying to shut down Protestant Christianity. And the church in Magdeburg said, nope, we're going to, here's our word for the day, resist you. And they set forth in a document called the Magdeburg Confession, what today is known as the doctrine of the lower magistrates. In brief, if the government goes outside of its biblically defined role and acts evilly or unjustly, then Christians not only can but have a duty to respond with what is being called righteous resistance. And I think that's where we need to begin. Understanding John Knox was more than happy to fight. You see people like Ulrich Zwingli in Zurich. He went to war. He died going to war against, literally in war. He was quartered by the Roman Catholic Church because he was going to war. There have been others who would say, no, that is not the Christian response. We do not have the right to fight and go to war. We do have a right to defend our person and our family's persons, but we don't have a right to resist in that sense of the word. And that is, I think, the second consideration for us. Let's understand uh, we're not the first ones to go, hey, 
How do, how do we figure this thing out? It should give us all a little bit of humility. Not my special gift, but it should. Because a lot of smart people would disagree with me from church history and today. And vice versa. Second, I think we need to really be careful when we word, use the word resist. Because I've been seeing the word bandied about a lot. That Christians have a right and duty to resist righteously. Now we're going to try to determine if that's exactly what Paul is teaching in Romans 13. Or Peter in 1 Peter 2. Or Paul again in Titus 3. We'll wrangle through that. But let's be careful with the word resistance, because we might, if you disagree with me on this particular issue, now please note, in discussing the doctrine of lower magistrates, I'm not taking a position on the V. I'm not taking a a position on mass. We're just going to lay out what the Bible teaches us about how Christians are to respond when the government does something that we deem to be un just. The word resist needs to be parsed really carefully because that could range, couldn't it? Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to speak out against it. That's resisting. I'm not going to do it. That's resisting. I'm going to fight against you. That's resisting too. So what resistance are we talking about? I think we have agreement on this, that if the government, Acts 5, I think the other day I said Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5 says that we have permission, courtesy of Peter and John, uh, John and Peter, who were, were preaching publicly, and they were told to shut it down. They said, we can't do it. We must obey God. Therefore, you and I, if we are commanded to sin, do not need to do what we are told. In fact, we should not do what we are told because the government authority, which has been given to some people by God, does not trump his authority. But that's why I think it's better to use a different word than resist. I think that we have biblical times, biblical opportunities to say, I cannot do what the government commands me to do. In other words, I cannot be obedient to a sinful command. That, I think, is something that we would all agree on. Are we, however, allowed to resist in that we push back? Now, historically, the answer to that would have been different than it is in our 21st century America, dating back to the 18th century, where we have documents like a Declaration of Independence, We have a constitution, we have a bill of rights, and we have a different system that was ever seen. We are by the people, for the people. In other words, this government is made up of people. Now, I think a lot of that is to state that that people are the ones that government should be serving, uh, that that we're not going to be a a royal nation in that we've got kings and queens. We are a government by the people and for the people. And now, suddenly, noodling through, do I get to resist, becomes a challenge. Why? Because you could even, I think, powerfully argue from the Second Amendment that we actually are given permission to forcefully resist the government. Now, that's a first in human history. But that's where we're at. So this is the context that we're going to work in while dipping into church history where that wasn't the system. So now we're confronted with this question. The document on which this nation is founded, tells me that I have the right to resist. Now, we're going to use the word forcefully resist. If if we agree that that that's what right we are being given, that we can forcefully resist First Amendment, Second Amendment to the Constitution, then I need to ask, does the Bible give me that permission? Because if... The government says you are free to do this, but God says you're not. Well, we know who wins, don't we? And that's where we're at. Do we have the right to forcefully resist whatever whatever manifestation that is? I think we would also agree on this when it comes to the word resistance. Here's where we can find common ground. Not only will we not obey when we are commanded to sin, 
But we will also do what Paul did. And a number of people sent these emails and saying, hey, what about Paul? He resisted the Roman government when he was threatened with a flogging. He appealed to Rome that he was a Roman citizen. Therefore, he resisted. See, I think the word is, is tricky. I, I would not use in that instance the word resist. I would use, no, he appealed to the system that was in place to avoid an unjust flogging. We can too. We've got a system in place, voting, access to our politicians who are of the people. We can utilize those systems to, quote, resist, end quote. But do we have the right to go beyond that? That is what we are going to explore, courtesy of your really encouraging emails. And it's, believe me, it's not because everybody was agreeing with me, but it was encouraging because they were so godly. Next on Wretched Radio. Thank you for resisting the trend. This is Wretched Radio. The subject, mandated Vs. What is the Christian response? I offered some talking points a few days ago, inviting you to please let me know what other Bible verses you would bring to the party. You did, and they were all gracious, each and every one. I, I Believe me, I got a lot of emails. And everybody was not a jerk. And that's resisting the current trend. The dialogue, not just in the world, but in the church, has become so confrontational and aggressive. And you modeled such a delightful spirit. I, it was just a joy to read each and every one of them. And I want to respond to them so that we can work through this together. Please note, I'm not taking a position. I'm trying to figure out what the Bible says about the subject. And where virtually all of the emails led was to dealing with the the question, how do I respond to a government that is not behaving well? Are there times to, quote, resist, as mentioned? I don't think the word resist is a really great word. I think we need to define it. At least you need to put an adjective in front of it. We can resist when we're commanded to sin in that we don't have to obey. We can also resist in the sense that we can utilize whatever structures are put in place via our Bill of Rights, our founding documents, to make a change and to disagree. We have that right, and we should exercise that, just like Paul did. But do we have the right to go beyond that, to forcibly disagree? That is what many people these days are saying we have the right to. And and we need to admit, even though I don't agree with that position, there have been others historically that do. I cited the Magdeburg Confession. That is precisely what they're saying. Hey, we're not going to let this happen. We're going to fight. Now, let's just set that aside for just a moment so that I can lay out some of the caveats to this discussion. Is there ever a time... When you could punch somebody in the nose? I think the answer to that is yes. And you might say, aha, thinking about the band from the 80s, we, therefore, can punch the government in the nose. No, I don't think that that's that's in view. We are to defend ourselves. It is okay. Jesus told the disciples, bring a fighting sword. It's okay. You can defend yourself. Paul was willing to flee in unjust situations to defend himself. And we can too. If your person is being threatened, you can defend yourself. You you, you can use the equipment that we have available to us these days, still for a while anyway, unless, of course, you're listening in Australia. Utilize them if your person is being threatened, your life is at risk, your family's life is at risk. That's okay. But that is different than do I get to assess how the government is behaving. And when I determine I don't like what they're laying down, in fact, I think it's unjust. Actually, I think it's dangerous. And a lot of people do when it comes to the subject of mandated Vs. They are persuaded, hey, this thing is dangerous. This thing is bad. But I need to ask the question, does the Bible give me permission for forceful resistance? And I would like to Because so many emails cited Romans 13 with the explanation of how some people would say, no, there's there's exceptions 
to what is pretty clearly stated in Romans 13. All of us would agree Romans 13 is clear. It says submit to the government. Then they say, however, because Paul includes some details limiting the government's role, that therefore means when they act outside of that that role unjustly, I have the right to not submit and actually have the duty to resist. Let's just read the section of Scripture itself, and we need to put our hermeneutical hats on right now because we've got to ask ourselves the question, am I, as I interpret these verses, exercising exegesis or eisegesis? Am I reading out of it or am I reading into it? It's my position that you have to bring other thoughts to the table, other considerations, current issues to the table for the text to say, you're supposed to submit unless blank. Let's just see if that's what Paul had in mind. This is Romans chapter 13. And please note, if you've got your Bibles handy, we're going to be scooting also to 1 Peter 2. And perhaps even more importantly, Titus chapter 3. Does Paul give us a caveat inside of these verses? Here's Romans chapter 13. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So God has put every government in place. And that means our American system, the Chinese system. He's, he's, he, is, he is the one who gives governments authority. Now, are they behaving justly? No, they're not. Are they behaving righteously? No, they are, they're not. But they wouldn't be in power if God didn't want them in power. They're ordained by God. They are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God. And those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. Now, Please note, Acts chapter 5 kicks into gear here. If they tell us to sin, we don't do that. But when they're behaving unjustly in a way that I just don't like, causes inconvenience, changes, let's just say, from a free market meritocracy to an equal outcome system, do I have the right to resist forcefully? For rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you'll have praise from the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. Now, my friends who would adhere to the lower magistrate's doctrine would say, yeah, and that's the way that they need to behave, and there's no argument there. Everybody on the planet should behave rightly, including people who are in authority. But we're just reading the text right now. For he is a minister of good for you, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Question. Is Paul saying, therefore, if the government isn't behaving in the just fashion that you think is appropriate, you can resist? Or is he simply strengthening his point, uh, play by the rules? Don't don't go outside of them or you're going to be punished and it's going to be heaped on your head. Unless, of course, Acts chapter 5. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. That's what Jesus said. Pay your taxes even to a wicked ruler. Render, therefore, to all their due. Well, I've got to finish up verse 6. For because of this, you pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending, attending continually to this very thing. What? Making sure that society is running civilly. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Question. And we all agree that verse is really clear. The principle that is an unnegotiable is that our trajectory, our overall tenor is to be one of submission. I think that's really clear. I would simply ask you, Did Paul intend to say, you submit to them, but if they don't act in a way that, well, quite honestly, he doesn't even describe, in fairness, he doesn't, 
that you therefore can resist forcefully, that, that you can be a rabble rouser, that you can become a Christian zealot, if you will. Is that what he is trying to say? And I would simply lay that before you and, and ask you to noodle through that, keeping in mind 1 Peter 2 says pretty much the same thing. Paul, uh, Peter invokes the authorities. But here's what we've got in Titus chapter 3. He invokes the authorities and what their role is. This is Titus 3, however. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we were once foolish and disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of Jesus was shown, he changed our hearts, and now we don't think like complete evil knuckleheads. He doesn't invoke. This is the restriction. This is the limitation on how much you need to submit to the government. Again, if they're threatening your person, you can defend yourself. If they are doing something evil or commanding you to do something evil, rather, then you do not have to do that courtesy of Acts chapter 5. But Titus doesn't seem to be injecting any sort of out clause. And that would be a section of Scripture, therefore, in Romans chapter one, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Simply ask yourself the question, was Paul intending to give us rules of resistance? And I would also ask this, and I know this is an argument from silence, but it sure does seem on something that would be this crucial, especially when the gospel is in view, which is why we submit to government, courtesy of 1 Peter chapter 2 and Titus chapter 3. Why don't we receive any indica- any rules about how this forceful resistance should be done, when it should be done, how to carry it out, when a government qualifies? I lay that before you for your thoughtful consideration. This is Wretched Radio. Houston, I think we have a few problems here. Go ahead, Richard One. Besides the fact I'm wearing a cardboard helmet, Houston, you have got one of the biggest false teachers in the universe. Are you kidding? He is so rich. Uh. How rich is he, wretched one? (laughs) I can see his house from here!